All right, I think we will get started. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. My name is David Failing, and my position with Lucas Diesel Systems is that of New Business Development Director. I'm very pleased that you could join us for our UK webinar today. All the information we will cover today will apply to the UK market. But before we go too much further, I would like to introduce to you our speakers. In the middle of your screen, we have Mike Rain. Mike is a Lucas Diesel Systems board member and based in the US. To his right, we have Jose Arnau. Jose is sales manager for Lucas Diesel Systems and based in the Midlands of the UK. I would like to let you know that if you have any questions, please place them in the Q&A section of the Zoom program that we're using. Normally, this button is located at the bottom of your screen. So if you move your cursor or your mouse down to the bottom of the screen, you'll see a menu with a variety of different uh, items on there and uh, you'll find the Q&A. Now I've got to tell you that this morning I was looking for mine and it got moved to the top. So if you just move your cursor around, you'll find it either at the top or the bottom of your screen. But we will answer all of your questions at the end of our presentation. Moving right along, I'd like to start off by giving you a brief idea of who I am, as well as where I have worked in my career. I have lived and was educated in several different countries of the world, including England, the US, and several Latin American countries. I started my career with Joseph Lucas Limited in Birmingham, England, completing a four-year apprenticeship program and studying engineering at the University of Birmingham. And as you can see from this uh, photograph on the left-hand side, this is uh, Joseph Lucas Limited, uh, Great King Street in Birmingham, England, for those of you in the UK who are familiar with, uh, with Birmingham. And this photograph was taken somewhere in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and uh, I will move right along here. After graduation, I went into the service liaison division of Lucas Sales and Service, traveling to various locations in England, performing audits and repairs on electrical as well as diesel fuel injection test equipment. I then went on to work for Leslie Hartridge, a division of the Lucas Group of Companies. From there, I accepted a position with Hartridge Equipment Corporation in Virginia Beach, Virginia, as a service, a, a service engineer to be the liaison between the company in England and its US operations. I was later promoted to the position of service manager. After many years with the Lucas Group, I joined the Association of Diesel Specialists, ADS, assuming a full-time position as their technical education director. A few years later, I was promoted to the position of executive director. I brought a great deal of international experience as long as along with many cultural experiences, including being fluent in English and Spanish to my two previous careers. I left ADS earlier this year after 27 years of service and was honored to be invited to join Lucas Diesel Systems as their new business development director. No matter how long you've been in the diesel fuel injection industry, 2020 has been a year unlike any other, not just in our personal lives, but, but also in our work lives. Eight months now into social distancing, it is highly unlikely that anyone in the industry has it all figured out yet. There are just too many moving parts and unknowns, but we believe that many of you have discovered a piece of the puzzle. And by working together, we can all get a little, more, a little more clarity on what the future of our industry will look like and how, how we can not only survive, but thrive. The power of, this is the power of collective wisdom. While live events have dwindled, we're all working harder than ever to stay connected, pivoted, as well as adjusting to new realities to plot a smart strategy for the future. For our part, Lucas Diesel Systems is committed to bringing you the latest information and advice 
so that you can make informed decisions. This webinar today will give you an insight into who is Lucas Diesel Systems, the future of the diesel as applied to the UK market, and what new opportunities does Lucas have for your business? We at Lucas believe that the best way to support our industry's recovery is to make valuable information widely available to those in our industry. We're committed to helping our industry move forward in this very difficult time. <clears throat> As we take a look at this innovation timeline, we can see that Mr. Joseph Lucas started the company in Birmingham, England over 150 years ago. And basically I'm referring to this portion here on the bottom left uh, part of your screen. As time progressed, um, we developed uh, the, the company into a variety of different product lines. And this uh, map here will show you the various different Lucas company dis companies divisions and where they're located worldwide, as well as the extensive product range that we have. Lucas Diesel Systems has offices and production facilities, not only in the US, but in Panama and Central America, in Brazil, in the United Kingdom, in Italy, as well as in Spain. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Mike Rain. Mike is a Lucas Diesel Systems board member and Mike was the managing director for diesel in TRW, followed by 13 years at Delphi as the managing director in the US, and then as the global managing director for diesel aftermarket and global Delphi vice president until 2013. Additionally, worth highlighting are his positions within corporate and industry boards and committees, including Delphi regional boards, ADS Executive Committee, ADS Board Member Chairman, and SAE Diesel Academy. The title to Mike's presentation this morning is The Future of the Diesel as Applied to the UK Market. Mike, welcome. Thank you very much, David. And uh, I assume my slides are showing up, David? Yes, your slide's showing okay, you're ready to go. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Well, first of all, it is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to have the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you today. Um, I appreciate how busy everybody is and under the current uh, economic uh, conditions, uh, taking an hour off is, is very difficult. So thank you very much. Um, we're gonna focus uh, on a number of key areas but really, um, I want to thank all of the people at uh, Lucas Diesel, um, uh, our CEO, Oscar Villafranca, um, uh, David, who's done a great job, uh, Jose, uh, who's done a great job in the UK, and we'll be talking uh, a little later on in the presentation, and the architect behind the entire uh, presentation and all of its uh, media elements is Ishoni. So thank you, Ishoni. Once again, great job. Much appreciated. So during the, uh, during the few minutes that I'm going to be with you, I really want to focus on the, the market, uh, some of the challenges, some of the opportunities. Um, where's the industry going? What's the path forwards? As David has mentioned, uh, COVID has been a, an issue for us, and, and there's, there's, there's no question eh, that that is an issue that has affected everybody on this call. Prior to... Uh, Prior to uh, COVID, when we look at the industry, the industry was on a very, very strong track um, in all markets, all technologies. Um, March of 2020, of course, that stopped. Uh, we entered a period of uncertainty. Uh, here we are eight months later, and we have much greater clarity on what the medium and long-term future looks like. 2020 has been a rough year and will continue to be a challenging year. We expect the, uh, the global industry, the global automotive industry, uh, to progressively recover in Q1 
and Q2 of 2021. So we're on a track to recovery. If we look at the various markets, Europe follows the global trend. Uh, there are some variations, but it basically follows that trend. Um, inside of Europe, uh, we have some nuances with Germany, Spain and France. If we look at the UK, the UK is tracking very much with the global trend in terms of 2021, 2022, on through 2025. There's been a lot of debate and discussion about recoveries, uh, V-shaped recoveries, U-shaped recoveries, delayed recoveries. Uh, the bottom line is that this is highly variable. It dependent upon government stimulus, cash flow, uh, adherence to uh, government guidelines and deferred new vehicle purchases. So it's, it's pretty complex. A lot of people have reflected back to 2008 as being the closest uh, event. And this, of course, was the great automotive recession. And that's kind of what it looked like. But I think for most of us, we're really focused yeah, on our own specific businesses. And I believe that for most people on this webinar today, that centers on powertrain and the aftermarket. And inside of the aftermarket, the OE channel, the OES channel and the independent aftermarket channel. Inside of the aftermarket, there are really four elements in terms of component parts. There are performance component parts, discretionary component parts, maintenance component parts, and essential component parts. Essential component parts really captures safety and security. And from a powertrain standpoint, uh, things like fuel injection, both gasoline and diesel, and turbochargers. We believe that performance and discretionary parts are probably areas that are suffering the greatest and will suffer the greatest in either one yeah, of the different scenarios. Maintenance and essential, uh, we believe that those uh, areas of the business uh, will fare fairly well under all different scenarios, whether it be a V-shaped or whether it be U-shaped. And in fact, if we take a spring back to 2008 and we look at what happened to the aftermarket in 2008, we believe that the, uh, the current situation will track fairly closely to that. There'll be variances country to country, uh, but that's kind of what it looks like as we start the process of moving into Q1 and Q2 from a forward planning. Having said that, I think what we need to remember is that as we exit COVID, uh, we will then have to deal with all of the issues and the challenges that we had in 2009. And from a powertrain industry standpoint, that's emissions legislation, fuel economy legislation, inner city congestion. So those are the things that we have to deal with and we must include them in our forward planning as we exit 2020 and enter Q1, Q2 of 2021. In the UK, it has been rough. If we look at the uh, popular press, the popular press uh, um, has been fairly aggressive in its commentary on diesel. At the same time, we have Brexit. So the UK has had a really tough period in terms of the popular press, diesel, Brexit, and of course, against the backdrop of the bigger debates and discussions, global warming, energy conservation, um, inner city congestion. So there's a big debate about powertrain. Where is powertrain going? The popular press would, would have us believe that powertrain um, of all configurations, whether it's gasoline or diesel, yeah, is rapidly exiting and coming to an end. I would suggest yeah, that if we look at powertrain, powertrain and its future is not regional. The future of powertrain is global. All markets utilize powertrain from the standpoint of all of the aspects that we'll discuss today. And we'll discuss passenger car, light truck, medium and heavy duty, ag industrial construction and marine. A lot of discussion is being held on global warming. 
if one country were to solve its uh, emission problems, that would have little impact on the global picture. And the same is true for powertrain. So this is not a regional debate, this is a global debate. And as we look at that debate, we'll find significant differences market to market. Europe is more focused on emission legislation. North America is more focused on fuel economy with cafe legislation. The Asian markets are more focused on inner city congestion. So it's complicated. And, and I think it's really best captured by this statement. Uh, and, and the statement, I think, at the end of the day is really, at the end of the day, highlighting yeah, the fact that we need to utilize all of the technologies, all of the tools in the toolbox are going to be required for us to solve the complex problems that we face globally. So let me, let me take just a, a few moments to talk a little bit about uh, two of the largest markets. Let's talk about Europe and let's talk about the States. Both of them from a market standpoint have about the same production volumes, about the same uh, populations and about the same um, installed uh, vehicle base. So when we look at Europe, uh, Europe has done a pretty good job in terms of fuel economy. Um, the split in terms of the market, the vast majority of the light duty sector is passenger car. There's a small sector which we would class as sport utility or light truck. So we've ended up in a situation where in Europe, our fleet average fuel economy is 46 miles per gallon, uh, which if we look at the US um, is uh, significantly better than the current US. But when we look at the US market, the US market has a different configuration. The, um, the light duty sector is split 52, 48% uh, light truck versus passenger car. And that is the preference yeah, of the market. And as we, we look at that market going forwards, there is every indication that that will continue. In fact, the switch from car to light truck started back in uh, 2013 and continued on through 2019. And forward projections tell us that um, as, we, uh, as we move towards 2025, we'll end up in a situation where light truck yeah, has nearly 80% of the market. So therefore, the problem with the US is very much focused on fuel economy. The fleet average fuel economy for the US yeah, is going to be around 24 miles per gallon. And if we compare that to the targets for the US, right now the target for the US is around 50 miles per gallon in 2025. So the point I'm highlighting is different markets have different issues. And that has to be captured in the overall powertrain debate. Europe is very much focused on emissions. The US is very much focused on fuel economy. And that discussion and debate yeah, extends as we look at Asia, which is very much focused on congestion. So as we look at powertrain, we have to embrace all markets, and we have to embrace all sectors. And those sectors include on and off highway. For the Asian markets, we have to embrace the need for powertrain technologies, which will address inner city congestion. So as we look at the world, and as we look at the global problems, this is what I believe, and uh, I would say at the end of the day is a fairly widely held view powertrain actually looks like. Move from the left to the right hand side of your screen. On the right hand side of your screen, we see the general consensus for powertrain through 2030 and potentially beyond, beyond that. So powertrain embraces diesel, gasoline, uh, natural gas, mild hybrids, full hybrids and battery electric. And the internal combustion engine extends beyond diesel and gasoline into mild and full hybrids. Now we have a situation where we have more tools in the toolbox. Utilizing all of those tools, 
Now we stand a reasonably good chance of addressing the issues and those issues as we've just described. Emission legislation, fuel economy, inner city congestion, and the ability for us to successfully support the ag industrial construction marine and heavy duty truck industries. So as we exit um, this, um, this sector of the, of the presentation, I wanna really come back and emphasize yeah, global problems require global solutions. And that is what the industry is working towards. So let's talk a little bit about the industry. So who's driving powertrain? We talk a lot about the overall vehicle production. Yeah? Seldom do we climb inside the sectors. The engine sector or the powertrain sector is a $179 billion industry. Underneath that, you've got electronics, uh, which is part and parcel, 127 billion, and then telematics at 23. So here we have the industry yeah, from a size standpoint. Yeah? So how effective has that industry been in addressing issues and problems over the last 10 to 20 years? Well, just let's take a look at emissions. Emissions over the past 20 years has benefited from all of the technology associated with these sectors. Look at particulates, 98% reduction. Hydrocarbons and NOx, 96% reduction. CO, 98% reduction. And that's all happened as we moved from Euro 1 through Euro 6. One of my roles, um, as Deja David mentioned, um, was uh, a global role, and part and parcel of that was the introduction of Common Rail. It was a pretty exciting period, and Common Rail has made a meaningful difference. Take a look at the OM646. Euro 3, diesel struggled. With the introduction of Common Rail, Euro 4 became a reality. A quick step change in technology took us to piezo injector, and that gave us the ability to immediately comply with Euro 5, but look at the fuel economy improvement yeah, from 35 to 43 miles per gallon. So technology has delivered and will continue to deliver. And that technology is not just diesel fuel injection, that technology embraces turbochargers and a vast array of technologies which support this entire strategy of emission reduction, fuel economy improvement. And again, we don't have time on this webinar, but certainly we'll talk a little bit about hybrids, stop start, cylinder deactivation, um, and, and CVT. These are just a handful of the technologies that have been developed. In the UK, the popular press has been tough on the diesel, and there are issues. By the same token, I don't know as we've completely heard the full story. The powertrain industry's voice has not been strong and that is part and parcel, I think, of the problem that all of us are facing. There are a lot of different technologies that are being developed. Uh, certainly from the standpoint of combustion, we have really made some giant steps forwards with common rail, EUI and EUP. Think about uh, combustion and think about uh, injection from the standpoint of piezo injection with pilot injection, post injection, split main injection. All of these features uh, have entered the market and have now become standard. Add to that injector characterization. And those are just some of the technologies that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. The vast majority of the development work that is being done builds on that. So again, we're facing a group of, of complex problems. The solution is not eliminating technologies. The solution is utilizing technologies, using all of the tools in the toolbox combined with regional legislation. Well, let me switch gears and talk a little bit about the aftermarket and specifically service. One of the reasons I came back into the industry was, was this picture. 
the next five years are going to see more change than in the preceding 10. And let me tell you, the preceding 10 were pretty exciting. But as we move forwards, a vast array of new technologies, plus the introduction of new opportunities with mild hybrids and full hybrids and diesel and gasoline. It's going to be a pretty exciting ride as we move forwards. One of the concerns that we have is the aftermarket. The aftermarket obviously focuses on the distribution of parts and components and does a spectacular job. For the future, we're going to need the aftermarket to do more. And that debate and discussion is taking place both in the US and in Europe. Uh, the two aftermarkets are different, but the problems that we have to resolve are the same. As we move forwards, we're going to, be have, to do, have to be in a situation where we really understand what the aftermarket needs. And the aftermarket needs repair options. We've got hybrids. It needs technical specifications. It needs tools and equipment. It needs repair parts, repair parts and technical support. It needs specialized tooling and it needs training. At Lucas, we've spent a lot of time talking about training. For the future, there's going to be a need for cross-platform training, all makes all models. That's going to be key as these new technologies come in at a very much faster rate than this industry we've been used to. We've been used to a, a slower pace of technology change. Uh, that's, that's not going to be the future. At the same time, we have to look at capital investment uh, for the smaller facilities and the smaller shops, uh, capital's a backbreaker. We need all makes, all models. Systems need to be upgradable uh, and there needs to be uh, remote diagnostics and remote updates. So we need a different approach in terms of capital investment. On vehicle diagnostics, again, a critical element and a critical element in terms of the support that we require. We've talked about telematics for many, many years. And I think for many people, yeah, it's an interesting discussion. The reality is telematics is part of the path forwards. And if we take a look at the medium and heavy duty market, that market is not talking about telematics in the future. That market already utilizes it. Let me give you an example of the States. And I use this because the States has been very focused on developing telematics but the commercial vehicle industry in Europe and the States are very similar. So the comments work for both. So in the States, if we look at class uh, seven and eight trucks, the interesting thing is that of the uh, um, two million plus vehicles in service, there are 347 companies that manage uh, the vast majority of those vehicles in large fleets. So those 347 companies have a minimum of 1,000 to 2,000 vehicles per fleet. So we end up in a situation where we've got the power of size here. So those fleets have looked at telematics over the past 10 years and looked at it from a commercial standpoint. And the question they asked 10 years ago was, how can telematics improve the overall business from a revenue, from a profitability standpoint, and from a customer standpoint? The net result is this. Telematics is widely used by the commercial vehicle industry. It provides back office, track and trace, smart navigation, driver and vehicle two-way communication, electronic vehicle inspections, fuel optimization, vehicle uptime maximization to mention a few. The beauty of this is that the large fleets have funded the telematics. That has been a boon to the industry as a whole because that technology and that opportunity now flows down to the smaller fleets, fleets that many of you have as primary customers. And a big part of where telematics is going is remote diagnostics and predictive failure analysis. That's right in our wheelhouse. What is also in our wheelhouse is if we look at North America and we look at Europe, the fleets are very similar. So the vast majority of the fleets are diesel. So these are 
at the end of the day, yeah, key customers for us. So as we look at the technology, I think one of the things that we realize, and you might have wondered what this picture is that I've shown a, a few times through the, through the last 15 minutes, this is telematics. This is connected vehicles, vehicles talking to vehicles and vehicles talking to uh, control centers and vehicles transmitting uh, failure codes. So this is what the future looks like and to a greater or lesser degree for the commercial vehicle industry, what is actually happening today. For the fuel injection industry and for the powertrain industry to really move forwards, we need partnerships. And that is one of the focuses that we've had in Lucas over the past year is to really look at those partnerships, people who can provide and integrate the type of diagnostics and the type of equipment that we need to provide services to our customers in the commercial vehicle sector and as that technology moves into the light duty sector. Pretty exciting times. Well, let me summarize. Okay. Without a doubt, COVID has been a real challenge, I would say, uh, for all markets. We believe, uh, and I think this is an industry view, uh, that in quarter one and quarter two of 2021, we will see some marked uh, improvement yeah, in the overall status of the industry. And that view is held widely by economists, by manufacturers, yeah, and by individual markets. We also believe that when we look at powertrain, the solution to our global problems is to utilize all of the tools in the toolbox. And in our toolbox, that includes diesel, gasoline, um, natural gas, uh, mild hybrids uh, combining the internal combustion engine, full hybrids combining the internal combustion engine, and of course, battery electric. We believe that that is our best shot uh, to handle some of the specific problems yeah, across the world. Emission legislation, fuel economy legislation, or CAFE, corporate average fuel economy, inner city congestion. To move forwards, we need partnerships. And, and I think that that is a key element, uh, and perhaps it's a theme uh, that I'm hearing throughout the industry that most of the players are looking to extend and to develop strong partnerships to address those technologies and to address those market opportunities. And that, I think, is what you will hear um, as Jose provides his presentation and as we wrap up. So I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention. It's been wonderful to talk to you again. Um, I look forward to the future, uh, the next five years, are going to be really exciting and uh, I, I think it's going to be fun for all of us to be a part of it. So thank you very much and David I will hand back to you and I believe over to Jose. Thank you very much. Mike, thank you very much for that most informative and I would say not only informative but very optimistic view of our, uh, of our industry. I think this uh, will serve everyone very well. Um, and now, without uh, further ado, um, Jose is uh, going to share his screen with us. Yeah. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Jose Arnau. Jose is UK sales manager for Lucas Diesel Systems. Jose is a flexible sales oriented engineer with four years of experience in business to business sales in the automotive sector. His first contact with sales teams was in Ferdinburg Sealing Technologies as a sales application engineer. After a couple of years, he became an export sales manager for the Breda Lorette brand in Italy. Moreover, he has recently completed an MSc in Automotive Engineering at Birmingham City University and has joined the new Lucas Diesel project in the UK as a sales manager for this region. Focused on the development of the Lucas Components family, he has demonstrated his sales and management skills 
establishing key accounts in the UK. Jose, welcome. Thank you very much, David. So, first of all, thanks to everybody uh, for joining us in this meeting. Uh, of course, I would like to thank as well all the Lucas team because everyone is providing a very interesting and supportive uh, you know, uh, help during this strange period we are facing today. Uh, so as we can see in this index, first of all, we will start with the role in the UK market. And then we will move forward to the second section, which is fuel injection parts and new references. Then we will move forward to the product range equipment. Then we will look at the Lucas Academy and we will summarize and I will show you, present to you the service opportunities we are providing with the Lucas brand now in the UK. So to start with the first section, we we'll start with the role in the UK market. As already introduced by David, for me, being an automotive engineer, as well as having four years experience in business to business in the automotive sector, allows me to understand how to prepare the strategy for starting again the development of the Lucas brand in the diesel sector here in the UK. In particular, I've gained expertise in new business development worldwide, so I am applying that experience and contacts to the development of the new Lucas project in this region. Moreover, as mentioned, of course, by Mike, nowadays the UK and many European countries are facing a topic that concerns global interest, which is global warming caused by greenhouse gas emissions. This means that, of course, stringent rules are being applied to maintain green zones in the metropolitan cities. However, recent news illustrates that, for example, as mentioned by Mike as well, Euro 6 diesel engines have significantly improved the reduction of emissions. For example, in the business where we are working, so with Reman products that are absolutely competitive and provide added value to sustainability, are helping, of course, uh, to maintain our world as much as possible sustainable. And again, here to highlight that the core value of the Lucas family, it's been a multi-brand and green spirit family. So moving forward, I will start presenting you the fuel injection parts and the new references available in the Lucas family. As we can see here, we are starting with the Raman family, which represents one of the core business of Lucas Diesel. We cover more than 2,400 remanufactured products. And this is because we went back in trading of injection pumps, common rail pumps, common rail injectors, unit injectors, diesel injectors, industrial unit injectors, and industrial unit pumps. So what stands out from these two slides is that we are fulfilling all the sectors with our product range from automotive, which includes cars, light duty, heavy duty, then agriculture and marine. So in this slide, what we are trying to show to you is that of course we are a multi-brand spirit and we cover uh, of course the main brands in the diesel market. So for example, Bosch, Lucas of course, Denso, Delphi and Siemens Video. We cover conventional diesel products. So for example, injection pumps for Lucas DPC, or to mention some of the innovative technologies we are covering, for example, the Bosch CP4 common rail pumps, as well as the Bosch piezoelectric common rail injectors. Here um, we show again some of the main references in the market available in our product range, but I would like to highlight in particular our last developments, which are the last release we had in terms of EUI and EUP Raman units. Uh, so I am referring to industrial unit injectors and industrial unit pumps, where we are actually covering mm -hmm. final applications, such as, for example, Renault, Mercedes, Iveco, Volvo, and MAN, to mention some of them. So here we conclude mainly the Raman family, and now I start presenting you the components family. 
Um, so talking about the components family, as you can see from this slide, we are covering and we have the largest catalog in the market with more than 10,000 references already available in our catalog. Because in the components family, we have common rail injector valves, flow regulating valves, pump repair kits, injector repair kits and pump injectors, electric solenoids, head rotors, common rail pump plungers, nozzle, plungers and delivery valves. So what I would like to, again, in this case, highlight is that, for example, we have in our catalog control valves and nozzles for, for example, Bosch piezo injectors. So again, covering final applications that are very important in our market, such as Renault, Mercedes, <clears throat> Volkswagen, Ford, BMW, again, for mentioning some of them. And this is something very important for us because the oil manufacturer has not yet developed the aftermarket solution. But we, the Lucas Diesel system, we are providing to our customers all this solution. To mention another, for example, key product we have are the orifice plates and nozzles for denso common rail injectors that will allow you to fix in the end, again, final applications such as, for example, John Deere, Toyota, Nissan, Isuzu, and Mitsubishi. That again, in this case, the oil manufacturer has not yet developed as an aftermarket solution. So we can say again that with the Lucas brand, we are able to cover conventional products, but also innovative technologies that are absolutely requested and needed by the market. So moving forward, we can see here again some of the main references available in our components family. I would like to highlight, for example, that we cover in the pump repair kits uh, some references, uh, very innovative, which are the Bosch CP4 pump repair kits or master kits uh, that in this case, for example, includes with our master repair kits, the camshaft, the valve tappet kit with the roller, the part sets, and also we are able to supply the metering valve for these innovative products that again are trying to cover final applications such as, for example, Mercedes, Volkswagen, or General Motors engines. So we have the know-how and the experience for repairing this type of pumps. So we are running some free webinars as well for these kind of uh, applications where we are sharing our experiences for repairing, for example, CP4 pumps with our master repair kits. And I absolutely encourage you to join us in our next webinars for more specific technical information. Here again, moving forward, for example, I can uh, highlight the fact that in terms of injector repair kits and pump injectors, we have availability for repairing uh, Bosch piezoelectric injectors, which are, of course, an innovative technology and another uh, conventional, for example, uh, components available in the Lucas family is the head rotors. So for example, for, uh, for final applications such as the Lucas DPC injection pumps. So uh, again, highlighting main, uh, the main references that we are covering with our, um, with our nozzles, with our common rail pump plungers or plungers and delivery valves. Uh, and we want to give the message to all of you, which is of course that we are offering full support and with our multi-brand and flexibility, we are trying to cover in different levels of businesses in the automotive sector. So uh, we close the main two families, which are the Raman family and the components family. And now we will start the product range equipment, which again, in this case, covers mainly test benches as well as calibration systems. Again, we are talking about Lucas. So Lucas is a multi-brand spirit company which means that with our test benches and with our calibration systems, you will be able to cover all the brands in the market by just using our test benches. So to start with the test benches, we, here we have the first one, which is the EDT 100, 101, which is called a universal test bench for diesel components, because in this case, you can cover test test for, for example, common rail pumps, common rail injectors, common rail piezo injectors, and pump injector systems. So we have here 
two uh, names because there is a main difference between the EDT 100 and the EDT 101 version. Uh, the, 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 the first, let's say, difference is that the former, so the EDT 100, don't have the kit to manage the full common rail injectors, while in the later, so the EDT 101, you've missed the CAM box kit, which allows you to emulate the real behavior of the camshaft in the diesel engine for simulating, for example, and testing unit injectors. So as you can see from this picture, this test bench will allow you to test up to four injectors contemporary. And for testing these four injectors, you will need just around 20 minutes total because that is the best performance guaranteed, of course, but by our best uh, test bench, which is the EDT 100 and 101. The maximum working pressure guaranteed is up to 2,000 bars for this kind of test bench, and it is able, able to simulate an engine speed up to 3,500 RPM. The repeatability and precision guaranteed is plus minus one percentage, and of course, this kind of equipment is able to generate the trim codes for all the brands after finishing the testing. The last point and the last feature I would like to highlight is that we are using a metering system that will not need any maintenance, no calibration is needed because we are using the colorist effect that allows us in the metering system to guarantee no maintenance and no calibration. So moving forward, we have here the EDT 200, which is a specialized test bench for common rail pumps. And in this case, of course, we are guaranteed all the main features uh, illustrated before with the EDT 100. But in this case, this test bench is only for testing uh, common rail pumps. Moving forward, we have the EDT 300, which is a specialized test bench for common rail injectors and common rail piezo injectors. And in this case, as well as in the, in the first example with the EDT 100, this test bench allows you to test up to uh, four injectors contemporary. So again, uh, just uh, guaranteed the same features as the EDT 100. What I would like also to highlight about all our equipments is that mainly all of them are automatic with a specific computer with touch screens displays included. The software we are providing is made to help your technicians to follow simple steps when performing the test according to OE manufacturers. Moving forward, we have the other ver version for uh, common rail injectors. In this case, it's called EDT310. And uh, the main difference is that you will be able to test just one injector per time. All the other features are the same. The EDT315, in this case, will allow you again to test with the same features, common rail injectors, common rail piezo injectors. But in this case, compared to all the previous test bench we have seen until this point, you won't be able, in this case, to generate your own trim codes after finishing all the testing. The last one uh, is a semi-automatic EDT320 test bench. So in this case, this is the last test bench for testing common rail injectors and common rail piezo injectors, because in this case, we are using, uh, we call the test bench a semi-automatic test bench because we are using the burettes uh, that you will read, that you will use to read the amount of fuel injected when testing your injector. The repeatability and precision, it is related with, of course, the tolerances available with our burette system. So moving forward and closing uh, all the test benches, here we have the EDT316, which is a specialized test bench for diesel Huey injectors. And in this case, of course, because of the different applications, we are covering in this case also heavy duty applications as well as ma the marine sector because of the Huey, Huey injectors. Uh, so in this case, the maximum working pressure is different. We are talking about uh, a working pressure up to 300 bars. Uh, this kind of test bench is able to test the pop-up valve leak test. And also uh, dif with different adapters, uh, you are able to do the test without really many uh, mistakes because of the 
the very simple steps uh, we are providing you uh, by following uh, our software included, of course, in the automatic test bench. So um, um, we have concluded all the test benches and now we are starting to see the first calibration system, which is an automatic calibration system uh, mainly uh, based on the fact that in this case, this is a full automatic calibration robot and will allow you to calibrate common rail injectors, common rail piezo injectors and Huey injectors, uh, let's say mainly in, an auto in a full automatic way. Because in this case, the expertise of the technician is not uh, very, uh, is not required to be at that higher level because the machine will help help the technician with all the steps needed. Uh, key features to highlight are that in this case, with just five minutes time, you will finish the, calibrator, the calibration of the shims for your injectors. Of course, the operator will spend more time in assembly and disassembly the injector. With these kind of machines, we are of course guaranteeing very high repeatability because these machines comes with an electronic probe with a tolerance of two microns. And again, all the uh, softwares help help the technicians with the technical drawings to fix and to I mean uh, follow the um, the tolerances, dimensional and geometrical that are needed for calibrating the machines. This one is uh, a semi-automatic calibration robot because as you can see from the picture, there is a, a disc that the operator will need to uh, calibrate manually when calibrating the shims. The uh, so this is the main difference because all the other uh, repeatability and tolerances guaranteed by the previous uh, um, calibration system are guaranteed as well in this specific uh, uh, calibration robot. The last one is the EDR720, which is a manual gouge for calibrating, again, common rail injectors, piezo common rail injectors, and Huey injectors. But as you can understand, in this case, the expertise of the technician, it is very, very important because otherwise, uh, the, in this case, the, um, the calibration will be, of course, uh, related with the expertise of the technician. In this case, the repeatability, again, depends on the expertise of the, of the operator. Uh, so concluding all the um, equipment family, here I am trying to show you uh, a very interesting tool, which is our e-catalog. And I encourage you to try and use it, just going to lucasdiesel.com, where you are going to be able to find, uh, of course, our e-catalog, and you will be able to we are providing customer service chats. We are, of course, providing a technical support thanks to, of course, our regional headquarters located all over the world. And this is some of the key features you are going to be able to find in our website. This is how it looks, uh, our e-catalog. So as you can see, for example, when you are going to search our references, you will be able to see the final applications as well as the picture of the component or of the unit, such as an injector in this case, that you were looking for. So um, the fourth section in this case will be based on the fact that I want to express to you uh, the importance that Lucas Diesel system is developing in the Lucas Academy, because our aim is to provide knowledge to all our customers on the innovative diesel technologies. So here we have an example and the, of the kind of, uh, let's say, uh, trainings we are providing with the Lucas Academy. And as you can see, we offer uh, learning platforms as well as technical assistance lines to try to train our customers. This is an example of a course summary. As you can see, for example, in this case, as after completing all the courses in a specific subject, you will become, for example, an innovative diesel injection specialist. And when you will finish all these courses, you will receive a certification from the Lucas Academy and that this will, of course, allow you to become a specialist in some specific uh, innovative technologies. 
So uh, we are in the last section of my presentation and uh, I will just try to summarize all the points and uh, as well as of course present to you the service opportunities you could have with the Lucas brand. So to start with this summary, I will say that of course, as you can see from the pie chart, when we're talking about the light duty, uh, we cover 93% of the light duty diesel market, which means that with the Lucas brand, again, with just one brand, you are able to cover very, very a huge percentage of the diesel sector for light duty applications. If we move to the medium duty, we cover a significant market share in vehicles with common rail systems with both piezoelectric and electromagnetic injectors. Turning to heavy duty, thanks to our last developments that I mentioned before, so for example, the, of course, uh, the unit injectors and these kind of final applications will allow us to, for example, fulfill uh, brands such as Renault, Mercedes, Iveco, Volvo, and MAN. And we have, of course, in this family, a new developments that are a work in progress. And we refer to, for example, final applications for Caterpillar and Cummins engines. <clears throat> then uh, talking about agriculture applications, we cover, for example, common rail with Denso application and EUI for Caterpillar engines, which is a work in progress development too. Finally, uh, the current covered business in the UK um, is a business to see channel with our main distributor, which is ECP, Europe Car Parts, where we have a tremendous success in this region. Uh, then we have the new business to business development that I am managing as a new development uh, sales manager in the UK, focused ba ba mainly in the Lucas component family, where we are, of course, demonstrating our outstanding sales and management skills, establishing new key accounts in the UK market. The last point is the Lucas diesel service that aims to create a global network for diesel specialist multi-brand workshops, where we are offering a complete solution to the diesel sector on spare parts, testing equipment, comprehensive training, and technical assistance. What I can say is that what stands out from these two points is that with the mentioned business models, we are able to cover the needs from workshops, fleets, specialists, distributor specialist and distributor generalist. So this is the whole picture of what we can do with the Lucas brand. And to conclude, I would like just to thank you all of you for attending this webinar. And I will pass the word to Mr. David. Thank you again for attending the webinar. Jose, thank you very much for your comprehensive presentation uh, today. Uh, I think you've covered a tremendous amount and we really appreciate all the details that you have placed into that uh, presentation. What I'd like to leave, uh, not leave, but I'd like to uh, uh, place on here is our contact information. Uh, for those of you who are in the UK, I would uh, recommend that you contact Jose as Jose just explained all the various different uh, areas that he is covering. Um, I can uh, assist you in any other markets. So please uh, stay in touch. And uh, if you need anything else uh, other than the UK market, I can uh, place you in touch with the appropriate people. I'll leave the slide up here for just uh, a few moments so that you can jot down this information and then we will uh, try and wrap up uh, our presentation today. Okay, in conclusion, as you've just heard from Mike Rain, the aftermarket is extremely resilient. And we at Lucas are very optimistic about the future of diesel, not only worldwide, 
but here in the UK. As Mike showed us, it is not just our opinion. We have many, many parts of, of information here to back us up. In listening to Jose, you could see that we have a complete range of parts, whether it is for legacy products, all the way up to the latest kits or common rail injectors, and most of the products in between. Together with test equipment, as well as training, and more importantly, the technical support that we have for you as well. I know times are challenging today, but look to the future and ask yourself, how can I enhance my business? Things will get better. And in the meantime, remember, we are here as a long time trusted partner for you. Lucas Diesel Systems, through our team of associates, are available via a phone call, email, or through our webpage. I encourage you to contact one of our experienced representatives, such as Jose, and see how we at Lucas Diesel Systems can help you. And this is, uh, concludes our formal portion of our presentation. As I said earlier on in our uh, presentation or in my presentation, um, we uh, will go into the questions and answer portion of our, um, of our program today. And let's see if we can uh, answer some of your questions that you have. The first one here on the, uh, the questions is, what is the plan for the African market? Um, basically, we are working on that. I, uh, I believe that uh, during our previous presentation, which was a few weeks uh, back, um, I'm not sure who it was, maybe it was Oscar or maybe it was Mike, uh, who had mentioned, yes, we're definitely working on this. Uh, it's uh, a little bit more challenging than, uh, than you can probably imagine, but we're working on this. And as soon as we do have something for the uh, African market, then we will be definitely making an announcement. Um, our next question that we have, I've jotted some uh, notes here while uh, uh, Mike and, uh, and Jose were speaking. And uh, one of the first questions here says, what impact will COVID-19 have on the diesel aftermarket? Um, Mike, would you entertain answering that question? Yes, th thank you, David. Yeah, l let me see if I can... Uh... Uh, give that one a little bit of thought. Um, I, I guess at the end of the day, the thing that we need to be uh, to be clear on is that there are a number of moving parts which will vary country by country. So let me give you a generalised answer, uh, and then let's see if we can dive down and look at it from a country by country perspective. So from a general view. Yeah, most of the automotive market right now is preparing for deferred vehicle sales. So people are not purchasing vehicles uh, at the same rate in 2020 or even forecasted in the early part of uh, 2021 at the same rate as the plan that we had for 2019. So those deferred vehicle purchases automatically put the onus on the aftermarket as people keep their existing fleets for a longer period of time. Second point is that if we look around the world, most of the uh, governments around the world are focused on providing stimulus packages to try and get the economy back, uh, get people back to work. Um, in some markets, those stimulus packages are focused on rebuilding infrastructure, highways, um, bridges, uh, rail systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so what we see with those stimulus packages is that that injection into those sectors, the industries that are going to benefit from that are the uh, off-highway industries. So construction is certainly one. So if we look at the diesel industry from, a, uh, from an opportunity standpoint, where those stimulus packages are focused on rebuilding infrastructure, that is going to create a situation where your off-highway customers uh, are customers that you need to be talking to right now because they're preparing their equipment um, at the end of the day. Eh, that is something which is right in your wheelhouse. For the uh, on-highway markets, the deferral of vehicle purchase, again, puts the emphasis back on the aftermarket 
so again, it's an opportunity, I think, for the industry to capitalize on that. I would encourage each of you uh, or everybody on the call, you know, take a look at what's your federal government, what's the federal government in Spain, uh, Germany, uh, France, the UK, countries that surround you where you may have business. Look at what those stimulus packages are doing and that will give you a head start on which customers you need to be talking about. But I would say that um, there's, there's, there's some positives there. Hopefully, David, that gives a clue. Thank you. Yes, I definitely think so. Um, I have another question here that somebody has posed. Are new diesel engines, Euro 6, more efficient in terms of fuel consumption and emissions? Can we use these cars in low emission zones? Uh, Jose, would, would you be, uh, would you like to answer that one? Yeah. So yeah, of course, if we talk about the UK market, um, the Euro 6 diesel engines allow us to, uh, I mean, uh, use our cars in the uh, low emission zones in the UK. So definitely uh, the new developments uh, we are facing uh, in terms of reducing the emissions uh, allow us for sure absolutely to to use our cars in the low emission zones without any issues. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, Jose, that I, yeah. I think one of the things that uh, is interesting for us is if we look at the development of powertrain and we look at specifically uh, those countries where low emission zones feature, as we move forwards with hybrids, we're going to see uh, a, a significant opportunity for these uh, Euro 6 and beyond applications to be utilized as hybrids. And uh, certainly when we talk to the, uh, the major OEMs, uh, that's the direction they're headed in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the point here, which is absolutely the point that Mike is raising, is the fact that the uh, the information we have is that, of course, OE manufacturers are still continuing research and development in, for example, hybrid vehicles with diesel engines, which means that in the near future, we will continue to grow as an industry because these new opportunities will help us to develop new uh, innovative technologies for the diesel sector again. And if you add to that, the fact we've talked about in-cylinder combustion sensors for many, many years. And I would say at the end of the day, it's been frustrating because the, the cost of these sensors has outweighed uh, the industry's ability to, uh, to deploy them um, on large scale. But that is ending. And as soon as those sensors become part of the overall energy management system, then we take another step change in fuel economy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Thank fuel economy, fuel economy. I think it's a very um, amazing topic because there are many things that you might mention in your presentation as well related to V two V technologies, for example. So telematics again. Uh, there are many, you know, innovative applications such as we all know, for example, platooning control strategies that are allowing again the reduction of. Uh, the fuel consumption in cars, in diesel engines, as well as petrol engines, because just, for example, by having a lead, a leader and then the follower, because of the reduction, the drag reduction, which is created between the leader and the follower, the diesel engine, as well as the petrol engine, will just consume less fuel. Mm -hmm. So again, there are many um, um, innovative technologies that car makers are developing, and of course, that involves heavy duty, light duty applications as well, and medium duty. Thank you. Um, here's one other question. It states, uh, you have a 93% coverage for light passenger vehicle. What's your percentage coverage for commercial vehicle market, in parentheses, trucks and the heavy equipment markets for construction equipment? Jose, would you be able to answer that uh, question? Yeah, well, as I presented in the slide, uh, we are not giving a specific percentage uh, for this specific market because it is different if we talk about different regions. 
So if we talk about Europe, we, we will have maybe a different percentage if we talk about, for example, the US or America, or if we talk about Asia, which is another area where, uh, I mean, the final applications are different. So that is the reason why we are not putting a specific uh, percentage that we are covering with our uh, components as well as Raman units uh, in that specific uh, uh, yeah, application. All right. Well, thank you very much. But probably worth highlighting that there is a, uh, a focus on EUI and EUP, uh, which obviously from a uh, class six, seven and eight truck market are key technologies. So uh, that's, that's kind of an important footnote there. Definitely. Thank you for pointing Thank that you, out. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. All right. Uh, I believe that concludes all the questions that we have uh, that I can see here in our Q&A uh, section. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for taking the time out of your day to, uh, to listen to us. And uh, like I said earlier on, if we can assist in any way, you have uh, Jose's contact information as well as mine. And feel free to um, send us or call us up or send us an email. And we'll be delighted to be able to assist you in any way possible. So once again, thank you very much for your uh, participating today. And I'd like to thank uh, Mike and Jose for their presentations. We definitely uh, appreciate all the, uh, the work that went into that, as well as the folks behind the scenes that make all of this possible. Thank you very much. And I'd like to leave you with just a short three minute video. Um, so if you just bear with me a second here, I will get this uh, video up and running. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. You know the name, you know the color. Our iconic brand has been a familiar feature of garages across the globe for decades. We've been trading for 140 years and we've always provided parts and mechanics trust to get the job done. That's as true today as it ever was. Our portfolio covers premium quality products for automotive, motorcycle and home use that are trusted by the people who work with them every day. That's why, in so many countries across the globe, we're an icon. We've been continuously trading longer than any other automotive component brand in the world, and we're still growing. For over 50 years before the Ford Model T, there was Lucas. We launched our business in 1875 and made our mark with the legendary king of the road cycle lamp used on the penny farthing. And ever since, we've continued to innovate and develop across the world. Today, Lucas is a $150 million business with a global network. The story of Lucas is the story of one of the most successful automotive brands in history. And it's built on the creation of products that stand out in their class. Icons across electrical, engine drive, diesel, driveline, filters, turbos, classic motorcycle and more. Drivers and installers around the world choose Lucas, not just for our range and coverage, but the exceptional level of product quality we offer. Worldwide, our famous green boxes hold a wide range of parts for almost any vehicle. And we'll go on delivering new products. And we'll go on creating new solutions that keep people equipped for the future. They won't always be what you expect, but we know what the future looks like because we're designing it. Trust an icon, trust an innovator, trust Lucas. Thank you very much, folks. Goodbye. Thank you to everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Have you. a good day. Thank you.